happy Saturday. Maria Sibuya Marianne was born on April 2nd, 1647. So we are bringing out our episode on her as today's Saturday classic. Maria Sibuya Marianne was a naturalist and an illustrator who made significant contributions to the field of entomology and whose artwork was also an achievement in its own right. So enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. Tracy, you know this, but it's worth mentioning that there was a time when people believed that insects were somehow spawned from mud. In fact, I had a book as a child that was about (laughs) animals that discussed this fact, and I was perplexed that anyone ever would have thought that was a thing. It it seems very far-fetched now, but that's because science. Uh, And there were plenty of other misconceptions about where bugs came from, but the woman that we're talking about today helped dispel a lot of those myths and really improved the scientific study of insects and plants And she did it beautifully. This is sort of a wonderful marriage of art and science. Uh, Although she was not a scholar in the sense of having attended college for education, her work would go on to be studied by naturalists and was even used by the father of modern taxonomy, Carl Linnaeus, as he identified and named plant and animal species. So today we are talking about naturalist and scientific illustrator Maria Zabuya Marianne. And an interesting thing, her star is apparently on the rise because I have noticed all of a sudden as I was researching this, articles were cropping up on other sites about her. So she is uh, kind of a buzzword at the moment, apparently, but she's really amazing and worthy of all this attention. So that's who we're talking about today. Maria Zabuya Marian was born on April 2nd, 1647 in Frankfurt, Germany. Her father was Matthäus Marian, one of 17th century Germany's best illustrators. And her mother was Johanna Sebeya Hain. Johanna was Matthias's second wife, and he had inherited a print shop from his father-in-law from his first marriage. And Maria was born into a family of much older siblings that were from her father's first marriage. Before his first wife died, that couple had had five children together. So when she was born, Maria had two half-sisters who were in their 20s, another half-sister who was a teenager, and a brother who was 12. So she was the baby by a significant margin. But though her father was a renowned illustrator, and she undoubtedly inherited talent from him, she wasn't able to benefit from his influence because he died when she was only three. But her mother remarried, and Maria's stepfather, Jakob Merrill, was a painter who was well-known for his still-life work, which focused on just meticulously rendered florals. Yeah, this is a moment during research when I reached out to Tracy and said, this is one of those weird times when a thing I love meets up with a thing I'm researching, because I really like, in particular, Jakob Merrill's paintings. Uh, He has this one sort of signature color scheme on a lot of flowers that look almost like a peppermint stripe, and it's very beautiful. Uh, And you'll see it appear first in like individual images of tulips that he would paint, and then they kind of get worked into bigger Dutch Golden Age florals that you've seen undoubtedly. Uh, So it was kind of a lovely discovery that he tied into our show today. Uh, And Maria was interested in art from the time she was very tiny. I don't know how you couldn't be in that family. So her stepfather took the role of teacher and gave her a foundation that was going to serve her for the rest of her life. And it was assisting Merrill in his work that she found her own personal passion. While still very, very young, Maria would collect the plants and insects that served as models for Merrill's still life paintings. And gathering those specimens sparked her curiosity, and she became more and more fascinated with insects and plants. Caterpillars were of special interest to Maria, and she began keeping her own collection of them so that she could follow their life cycles as they transformed through the pupa stage and into butterflies. As she observed these processes, she started documenting them through illustrations. And Maria's practice of keeping insects and other living things and watching them metamorphose and or grow through their life was really quite significant. Other artists that made illustrations of plants and animals almost always were working from dead, preserved specimens. But Maria preferred to see all of her subjects alive to truly understand what they looked like and how they functioned. And it was undoubtedly this practice that she began as a child that earned her a reputation for work that surpassed all the scientific illustrators that came before her. 
At the age of 18 in 1665, Maria was married to one of Merrill's apprentices, an artist named Johann Andreas Graf. In addition to working as a painter, he was also a draftsman and a publisher as well as a copper engraver. In 1668, Maria and Johann had their first child, a daughter named Johanna Elena. And after Johanna was born, the family moved to Johann's hometown of Nuremberg. In the early years of Johanna's life, Maria began producing more serious illustration studies of flowers and insects. She once again began raising her own specimens and is said to have even spent nights where she got no sleep because she was watching over pupas that were expected to produce metamorphosed moths or butterflies. She didn't want to miss any of their transformations. Yeah, she was dedicated to watching them. She really, like, if she saw any movement in a pupa that suggested it might be about to release the um, the metamorphosed creature. She was like, nope, I'm just going to sit here and watch this no matter what. Uh, and in Nuremberg, Maria also began a series of floral engravings, which were published in three volumes over the course of five years, from 1675 to 1680. This publication, titled Blumenbuch, or Book of Flowers, was so popular that it was later republished as Neues Blumenbuch, New Book of Flowers, with additional plates and a new preface. Thirteen years into their marriage, Maria and Johann had a second daughter, Dorothea Maria. I was in 1678. The year after Dorothea's birth, Maria produced the first of two volumes titled Caterpillars, Their Wondrous Transformation and Peculiar Nourishment from Flowers. That was in 1679. Volume 2 didn't publish until almost four years later in 1683. Marion's volumes on insects were greeted with acclaim immediately. She had chosen to show moths and butterflies throughout their life cycles, and in each image, she showed them in each of their life stages alongside and interacting with the plants that served as the insects' food sources and habitats. Both the insects and the flowers were illustrated in incredible and accurate detail with annotation for each. And Maria's work had achieved an entirely new level in scientific illustration, as no one had ever documented the entire life cycle in this particular way. It astonishes me that it it was the 17th century before anyone did this. <laughs> yeah. Because it's such a ubiquitous feature in, like, science books for children now. Yeah, you always show the the habitat plants along with the insects. But they were always just uh, drawn separately prior to this. Just after Maria's floral book finished publication, and in the years between the publications of Volume 1 and 2 of her book on insects, her family pulled up stakes from Nuremberg, which had been their home for 14 years, and they moved back to Frankfurt. Jakob Merrill had died in 1681, leaving Maria's mother a widow. And so she and her husband Graf had moved to take care of her. Four years later, Graf moved back to Nuremberg. Maria and their two daughters did not move with him. In 1686, Maria, her mother Johanna, and her daughters, Johanna and Dorothea, all moved to a village in what was West Friesland, but would now be part of the Netherlands. They joined Maria's half-brother, Casper, in a colony of Labadists, which was a Protestant communist sect. That could be its own whole story in and of itself. Perhaps one day it will be. Uh, but we're about to talk about the official end of Marion's marriage and her ongoing studies of the natural world. But first, we will pause and have a sponsor break. Maria's mother, Johanna, had died in the village where her, her brother Casper lived in 1690. And the following year, Marianne took her daughters to a new home in Amsterdam. And throughout their stay with the Labadists, Maria and Johann Graf were still legally married, but they divorced the same year that Maria took the children and left the colony. She would later confide in a friend that the marriage had been poor and joyless. And she also sometimes lied about the end of their relationship later in her life, telling people not that she and Graf had divorced, but that he had died and left her a widow. Just kind of the, the cruelest thing you can possibly do to an ex. Oh, they died. <laughs> in Amsterdam, the family had a studio where they all worked on their painting. Both of Maria's daughters with Graf would go on to become skilled painters themselves. 
Yeah, this was definitely a family line of artists uh, from before Maria and after. And at the age of 52, Maria and Dorotea, who was 21 at the time, traveled to Suriname. That was in 1699. And at this time, Suriname was a Dutch colony, almost 5,000 miles away from their home in Europe. And for two women to be traveling there for an extended period of time without a man to accompany them, this was considered a very, very dangerous move. Add to that the fact that the trip was beyond expensive and it becomes clear just how much of a risk it was. Maria had sold as many drawings as she could and had gone into debt to finance the journey. Her hope was that she would be able to make her money back after she published a new book about Suriname's native wildlife. So this was really a huge gamble. But Maria, who up to that point had only been able to see dead, dehydrated, preserved specimens of the plants and animals that lived in Suriname, really craved the opportunity to see those species alive so that she could draw them as accurately as possible. They had planned to visit South America for a five-year expedition, but it was cut short after two years because Maria became ill. Initially, she thought her weakness was the result of too much sun and heat, but things really progressed to the point that she thought she might die if she stayed there, so she made the decision to return home. She and Dorotea returned to Amsterdam in September 1701, and exactly what she had contracted is unknown, although the two most likely candidates are malaria and yellow fever. Yeah, there's a lot of speculation, and since she did work with insects and was routinely going into the jungles to study them, those were probably... Uh, the two most likely things. But in those two years that they did stay there, both mother and daughter dedicated themselves to learning everything they could about the new species of plants and animals that they were exposed to. Of the many illustrations produced during this time, there have been some issues actually identifying which were done by Maria and which were done by Dorotea because their styles were very similar. This is a debate that sometimes still goes on. She published a new book in 1705, Metamorphosis Insectorum Surinamensium, which was Metamorphosis of the Insects of Suriname. There were more than five dozen engravings in the book, carefully detailing the life cycles of Suriname's insect world. The work followed the same format as her work on caterpillars, featuring each creature alongside its host plant life with detailed descriptive text. While her books on flowers and caterpillars were lauded as extraordinary achievements for botany and zoology, it was the Insects of Suriname book that would be considered her most significant work. For one, it was one of the first such studies of flora and fauna of that area. And second, it offered a wealth of new information about the food chains and developmental cycles of insects. This was really groundbreaking because it abandoned the idea of spontaneous generation, that maggots came not from eggs but from meat, and that insects were the products of mud, among other incorrect ideas about how insects come to be. Yeah, for a long time, people thought rotting meat was where maggots came from. And while that may be where their eggs, the eggs get laid that produce them, they didn't realize there was a whole egg aspect to it. They just thought the meat started some process. Uh, and while those myths were addressed, Maria's work was not above criticism, although most of that criticism came after her life. And we've got some fun proboscis talk right after we first pause for a word from one of our sponsors. Because of her dedication to carefully watching every moment of the insects' lives unfold, included in her Suriname book was a detail that she observed in sphinx moths, which went contested for quite some time. In her illustration of a newly metamorphosed moth that appears in the book, she shows it with what looks like a split tongue, if you're just looking at the picture. And in her accompanying notes, she described the two pieces combining to form a tube that allowed this moth to drink nectar. This is a time where prior unrelated research for my job allowed me to get to read this whole part and just feel already vindicated. (laughs) This was the text that accompanied the plate of the Sphinx moth, which notes the split proboscis and also gives you a sense of the types of notes that generally accompanied her illustrations. Here's the quote. The large green caterpillar ate the leaves both of this plant and of the sweet sop described in plate 14. 
It ate vigorously and greedily, yet had as little discharge and excrement as the smallest caterpillar. When touched, it thrashed around wildly. On 23rd June, it remained still and shed its skin. The skin it discarded is lying on the leaf. After the molting, it was no longer so green, but became more reddish in color. The next day, it changed into a liver-colored chrysalis with an external protuberance, like the one which can be seen on the stalk below. The chrysalis was very restless, throwing itself to and fro continuously for about a quarter of an hour. On 20 August, there emerged a large moth with six orange and yellow spots on its body, whose four wings and six legs were strangely covered with black dots. Its long proboscis consists of two long tubules, which in this species of moth are joined together, thus making a small tube through which they can suck honey from the flowers. When they have finished sucking, they roll the proboscis up tightly and place it under their head between the eyes so that it is scarcely visible. And there were critics of this particular drawing who claimed that it was proof that her work was not as accurate as had been claimed, hinting that she had added flourishes to her observations. And again, this happened after she had passed, and we'll talk about that timing in a little bit. But eventually, it was confirmed that some moths, the sphinx moth among them, have two half-tubules that do join together to form one proboscis. They are one of the most fascinating features of moths. Yes, along with, like, little rows of hooks that connect their wings together sometimes. To return to the subject at hand, similarly, Marion's illustration of a tarantula making a meal out of a hummingbird was decades out of her death, called out as an impossibility. Early 19th century naturalist Lansdowne Gilding called the plate a, quote, entomological caricature. British entomologist William Maclay tested the idea in the 1800s by offering a large spider in his lab a bird to eat. And when the bird, or when the spider fled, he resolved that Marion had, quote, told a willful falsehood. But of course, we know now that such things do indeed happen in nature. When Henry Walter Bates observed this same behavior and published his findings in 1863, Marion's depiction was validated. I literally did multiple She Was Right dances in my chair while reading this <laughs> outline when Holly wrote it. There were, to be clear, some errors in Metamorphosis of the Insects of Suriname. Some of these have been attributed to the abrupt end of her studies in South America and her need to create some of her illustrations from memory and preserved samples. For example, army and leafcutter ants are grouped together as though they lived in the same colonies. And some of the caterpillars are pictured with different butterflies than the ones they actually metamorphosed into. Yeah. uh, I mean, to be fair, any scientist has some errors along the way. And she did, that trip did not go as planned. So you could kind of see why. Uh, There's a really long and wonderful paper that I will link to in our show notes. It was one of my sources that kind of outlines why we should not discount her work just because there are some errors. Well, Um, we make errors sometimes. (laughs) Everybody, everybody anyone that deals with lots of information does. You can't help it unless you're a robot. And even then, sometimes robots make mistakes. Uh, But in that same book, slipped in along with the various notes on an illustration of a peacock flower with a caterpillar climbing its uh, stem and a pupa resting on a leafy segment and a moth sipping nectar from the flowers is an annotation that is not about botany or insects, but about slavery. In the notes, Marion wrote that enslaved women of Suriname would use the seeds of the peacock flower as an abortifacent, choosing not to have a child rather than to allow one to be born into the cruelties of slavery. She continued, quote, Indeed, they even kill themselves on account of the, un- of the usual harsh treatment meted out for them. So they consider that they will be born again with their friends in a free state in their own country. So they told me themselves. This was, of course, a unique outtake in Marion's notations, a rare deviation from the science of her work on flora and insects to comment on the dark side of colonialism and the slavery that came with it. She continued that the slaves, quote, must be treated benignly. (laughs) 
Biographer Kim Todd wondered in her book about Marion if this notation wasn't intended to provide food for thought for the people of Europe who might own slave plantations, many of whom would be the likely audience for this book. But as Maria made no further known remarks on the subject, we don't really know what she hoped to achieve with these particular passages. Yeah, it does stand out, though. It's sort of like, here we are, leaf cutter ants, and look at what the spiders are doing. Hey, slavery is horrible. And also, let's look at this plant. It's really like it jumps out as as out of context with the rest of the book. Uh, And we should note that while the peacock flower that she described in that passage was brought back to Europe by other explorers in the 1700s because of the appeal of its showy blossoms, that information of its use as an abortifacient was not widely shared, even though it had been known because of this work that Maria had done. And though the Suriname book brought praise and admiration, it did not bring the wealth she had hoped for. It did not stave off difficult times at the end of Maria's life. She really struggled to bring in enough money to sustain herself. To drum up cash, she painted flowers and sold her work for likely far less than it was worth in most cases. And she also began selling the many and varied specimens that she had acquired over her life and even used her connections to collectors to purchase more of them and then flip them to make a little more money. She continued to work, and she began collecting new insects as soon as the last illustrations for her Suriname book were completed. She also published revisions of her previous books. In cases where new information about the insects became known, she would update the illustrations and annotations to include the most current information. Maria's daughter, Johanna, who was also an artist and was not the one she took on that trip, followed that trail blazed by her mother and her sister, Dorotea, and she actually moved to Suriname permanently in 1711, taking her husband with her. And the following year, Maria, who had liquidated most of her collections at that point, really had a a big sort of shift uh, where she stopped corresponding regularly with friends and business associates. In 1715, Marion had a stroke possibly related to the fever that she had contracted in Suriname. She had been working on another Caterpillar book, but the project sat largely dormant after that due to a partial paralysis. Her son-in-law and Dorotea's second husband, Swiss Baroque painter George Gzell, painted Maria's portrait in these years near the end of her life. And in it, she is surrounded by curiosities and specimens from her collection. Maria Zabuya Marion died on January 13th, 1717. She was 69. A few days later, all of her remaining watercolors were bought for the Tsar of Russia, Peter I. As a result of the Tsar's interest in her illustrations, Maria's daughter, Dorotea, was offered a job in St. Petersburg as the official scientific illustrator for the Tsar. And nearly 100 years after her death, Maria's work was still influencing scientific illustrators. In 1801, English botanist and zoologist George Shaw included an illustration of a frog in his book, General Zoology Amphibia, and that frog was named the Marian frog, or Rana Mariana. It would later come to be known by the scientific name Trachycephalus venulosus, or by the more common identifiers of veined tree frog or common milk frog. The decades of observing insects and plants and taking copious notes on their life cycles that Maria did significantly advanced the scientific community's knowledge of entomology and botany. Unfortunately, some poor reproductions of her work that were published in the 18th and 19th centuries really damaged her reputations. We would examine these sloppily executed prints and that led them to believe that she had not been as skilled as she really was. And that time gap before the criticism of her work began is a really interesting aspect of her career and how her work was viewed at different points in history. At the dawn of the 18th century, when Marion published her book on Suriname, it was really well received. And it actually wasn't until the 19th century that people started to question things like the split proboscis on the sphinx moth and the bird-eating tarantula. As we mentioned, some of the problem was due to bad reproductions that just didn't capture the fine and careful details that she had poured into every illustration. But some of the problem can also be traced to the uh, shifting role of women in European society. When disbelievers of the 19th century saw elements in in Marion's work that they thought were incorrect, they wrote her off as a silly woman who must not have understood what she was looking at. 
Never mind that she had actually already advanced entomology significantly while she was alive. Yeah, she got written off because she was a woman a lot, which really kind of stunk. But thankfully, despite those criticisms, uh, one, she was proved correct on most of them, and two, her work has once again become recognized as a really important contribution both to science and to art. So much so that her book on Suriname's insects was actually republished at the end of last year, 2016, and just a few days from when this episode will air, there will actually be a symposium on her work in Amsterdam. So she kind of is becoming really, really popular again, which I love because, again— her illustrations are so beautiful. Yeah. Um, I could just gaze at them all day. And it makes sense that she was trained by a Dutch Golden Age painter when you look at her, <laughs> her illustrations. And I don't know why my brain never made that connection before. Yeah, well, and I had seen her illustrations before, but I knew virtually nothing about her life or even how long ago it was. Like, in my yeah. head, illustrations with the level of skill and detail that she had would would have been a little... Later. More recent. Yeah. Right. And and that's because they were so good in many cases, and she had so perfectly captured things that they're, they were used for, I mean, still they get referred to. So, uh, you know, that's why they seem, th- like, they must be more recent because we still see yes. them in textbooks on occasion. <laughs> and, of course, I do know that there was plenty of scientific work going on before this point. Uh, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of their aspects do seem to come off as a little more recent than they really were. Yeah. And again, her work was so amazingly good that that's why it feels more modern than it was. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 